Those of us who grew up with Back to the Future may have the idea that it was Marty McFly who did a 180, taking the skateboard from 1985 back to the 50s to nolly it into existence. But then you'd be goofy, because the early 80s was the age of fruit boots, while skateboards were rad in the 50s, and seeing Michael J. Fox street skating his way back to the future was one instance that kick-flipped it from the pure domain of skate punks back into the mainstream. And the skateboard is not the only thing that you might be surprised as a child of the early days of the Cold War. Welcome to Season 1 of Time Goes Cold War coverage in our series War to War, where we cover the events of the decades after World War II that brought man from the brink of destruction to the threshold of the stars. I'm Spartacus Olson. Ask a few historians when the world becomes modern, and you'll get as many different answers as the number of historians you ask. Ask us at what point the world became somewhat recognizable to a young person living in 2025, and chances are that at least a few of us will answer the 1950s. You might be surprised at how many of the things we today see as integral to our personal present and recent past, our own zeitgeist, and our proclivities that were created or even made ubiquitous in the 1950s. There are obvious ones like television and the widespread ownership of an automobile, and then there are others that are less obvious. Take the credit card, for instance. It all begins in 1949 at Major's Cabin Grill in Manhattan, New York. Businessman Frank McNamara is dining out with clients, but when the check arrives, he realizes he has forgotten his wallet. Embarrassed and determined to never let that happen again, he joins forces with a lawyer friend, creates Diners Club, and begins recruiting entertainment and dining venues that will accept credit from members if the club vouches for them. Launched first locally in 1950, it's an instant hit and quickly expands across the US. Within a year, they count 42,000 members and by 1955 have expanded to Europe, East Asia, and the Middle East. The effect is transformative to the essence of commerce. For millennia, purchasing on credit had been tied to a single seller by a relationship. But now it expands into a network of merchants. With the club's guarantee, the practical effect is that each merchant can now accept more purchase on credit and boost their revenue. The next step is when Bank of America rolls out Bank AmeriCard in California in 1958, which gives the cardholder a revolving balance, providing a portable, unsecured credit line to use from Main Street to mail order catalogs. Seven decades later, these principles have become a staple of everyday life, one of the main pillars of consumer freedom and the lubricant of commercial growth. The pessimist, or nihilist, will also point out that it has driven countless consumers into a burden of debt that holds them trapped in the hamster wheel of gainful employment. The effects of the credit card will become even more palpable once they are tied to distributed computing networks. For that to happen, you need to connect computers across geography, which leads us to another unexpected 50s technology, one you're using some form of right now as you watch this, the computer modem. But it's not commerce that drives this development. It's that other 1950s driver of technical development, fear of the atomic bomb. In 1955, the US Air Force have introduced a computer-aided radar system to guide interception of a possible bomber or missile attack by the Soviets. Based on a central computer and fed data manually, it's too slow for an effective response. So they want to expand this into the semi-automatic ground environment, SAGE, radar defense network. Simply put, they want to enable radar consoles to send data to the central computer on the fly using ordinary phone lines. So AT&T's Bell Telephone Laboratories are contracted to create what will be the first true computer modem. In 1958, the Bell 101 dataset is introduced to swap digital radar tracks between the widely dispersed radar consoles and the central ANFSQ7, Q7 for short, Air Force computer over ordinary voice grade telephone circuits, enabling near real-time coordination of interceptor aircraft. Their solution uses frequency shifting key. One audio tone representing binary one, another binary zero, allowing 110 bit per second traffic that matches the speed of teletyping. In 
1959, the 101 is released commercially, setting the conceptual and technical template for every dial-up and ultimately broadband modem that has followed. Now, that IBM computer, the Q7, is a behemoth of a machine, employing 49,000 vacuum tubes to perform calculations and weighing 250 tons. But soon, another 1950s technical introduction will shrink the size of computational machines so that eventually we will be able to carry computers in our pockets that are much, much more powerful than the gargantuan Q7. Q, the microchip. Again, it is US Air Force funded development inspired from civilian engineering and research. By the early 1950s, it's becoming clear that the advent of computers is creating a feedback loop of increasing computational needs growing exponentially by the output of the data from the computations they in turn feed. On May 7, 1952, at Washington Components Symposium, British radar engineer GWA Dummer warns computer designers of a looming tyranny of numbers that will force them into building machines that are impossibly big. His proposed solution is to miniaturize and put complete circuits in a single semiconductor, solid block. His proposal is based on a development for hearing aids. A few years earlier, German engineer Werner Jacobi has sketched the first integrated circuit-like device patented for Siemens in April 1949, a five-transistor hearing aid amplifier formed on a single semiconductor substrate. Now, already facing Drummer's problem head-on, the Air Force launched a miniaturization program and on September 12, 1958, Drummer's proposal is made reality when Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments manages to manually etch transistor, capacitor, and resistor elements onto a tiny bar of germanium, proving an entire circuit could be built into one crystal to create a functioning phase shift oscillator. This is the first working microchip. Robert Noyce at Fairchild manages to eliminate the manual parts of Kirby's etching process, producing a genuinely monolithic, scalable device, and files his seminal semiconductor device and lead structure patent on 30th of July 1959. These advances establish the fundamental many devices, one chip principle that underpins every modern microprocessor. The technicality and sterility of these advances masks an impact on humanity that is so huge that it's hard to grasp. The microchip will eventually make the world completely unrecognizable for anyone who lived before 1950. Ultimately, it will alter the very essence of what we are, who we socialize and cooperate with. Combined with the communication technology of the previous decades, microchips will tear down the physical barriers of interaction that for millennia has required us to be in some kind of proximity to each other to function together. It is the foundation of the digital age. What is one thing that we will use this technical revolution for? Fun and games, of course. I'm thinking specifically computer games. Now, many of you might think that this begins in the early 1970s with a game inspired by tennis, Pong by Atari. You'd be both right and somewhat wrong. While Pong will be the first commercially successful computer game, a very, very similar game of virtual tennis makes headlines in 1958. That autumn, at the Brookhaven Lab up to New York. They are preparing their annual visitor's day. William Higginbotham, head of Brookhaven Lab's instrumentation division, wants to change how static and non-interactive most science exhibits are at the time. He will later say that it might liven up the place to have a game that people could play and which would convey the message that our scientific endeavors have relevance for society. So on October 18th, 1958, he displays to the world a rather peculiar creation of his. He has diverted a Donner Model 30 analog computer built to plot ballistic trajectories to a five inch oscilloscope, which lets visitors twirl aluminum knobs controllers and bat a glowing dot over a single pixel net. The machine solves a second order differential equations 50 times per second, redrawing the ball's parabolic flight in real time. A side switch even changes gravity to mimic lunar tennis. The game, while played on a tiny screen, attracts long lines of visitors patiently waiting for their turn for a few minutes at these futuristic knobs. Predating Pong by 14 years, the exhibit proves a Cold War research computer can also amuse. 
bridging the gap between austere military hardware advances and computer applications for peaceful use. The experiment's enduring legacy is conceptual. It introduced head-to-head -head interactive graphics, physical peripherals, and spectator appeal, core pillars of today's $200 billion video game industry and of modern human computer interaction design. Now, while Tennis for Two is only a precursor to the games we play today, there is one toy that hits the markets in the 1950s and very much remains a cultural institution in 2025. Lego. Okay. So the company Lego was founded by carpenter Ole Kjærkjærsjansen in 1932 in Billund, Denmark. But the plastic brick took shape only after the company bought its first plastic injected molding machine in 1947. By 1949, Lego was selling cellulose acetate automatic binding bricks, loosely modeled on Hilary Page's British Kitty Craft blocks. In 1955, Gottfried. Christiansen's son is leading the company and focuses now mainly on toys. That year he articulates the System of Play, a mathematically coherent sizing grid in which wheels, windows, and plates lock into a single modular language. This standardization lets parents buy small sets over time instead of one costly kit. At this point, it's still the early version of Lego bricks that are solid and don't snap together as the top studs are simply fitted into holes at the bottom. The breakthrough comes on January 28, 1958, when Gottfried patents an internal tube design that combines clutch strength with near-perfect tolerances. Every brick made since then can still mate with that first run. By the end of the 1950s, Lego has already established itself in many parts of Western Europe, and in the 60s, the toy system will conquer the world. But why is it so successful? Well, in accordance with Gottfried Christiansen's system of play, Lego studs and tubes turn a passive toy into an active medium. Children become designers who can iterate, disassemble, and start again. Habits prized in engineering, architecture, and coding. That recursive play philosophy, enabled by precise 1950s plastics technology and a far-sighted patent, explains why bricks remain compatible, collectible, and culturally ubiquitous nearly 70 years later. But what about those skateboards? How do they roll into the 50s? Okay, so it starts almost half a century earlier with kids' kick scooters. While the two wheels in a row scooter version is commercially sold already in the early 20th century, kids soon start making their own by putting roller skates to a plank of wood and adding a steering rod to hold on to. By the 1930s and 40s, surfers in places like Leola, California start taking these scooters, stripping them down to just the board and wheels to go sidewalk surfing. Hence, when the ocean is flat, these rudimentary setups, often just a 2x4 with steel skates, let them emulate wave riding on hills. By the late 40s and early 50s, the fad has spread to many parts of urban America, but remains a subcultural phenomenon. Then, in 1958, the first commercial board is launched, and the rest is, as they say, history. Together. These developments are symptomatic of the zeitgeist that is taking hold of the Western world in the 1950s. Rapid technological development in a society increasingly driven by commerce and the pursuit of leisure by a growing middle class, living in a world that is growing smaller through virtual networks every day. Many of these advances are also the children of the other side of the metal, the deepening conflict and fear posed by the nuclear arms race. At the core of that conflict lies also a difference in Weltanschauung and entitlement. The communist East is pursuing a more serious, austere philosophy that leaves less room for individual pleasure and self-fulfillment, trying instead to focus forcefully on the lowest common denominator, the needs of the collective. Also, much of the world remains unable to enjoy the progress as they are economically disadvantaged, stuck with the heritage of policies of imperialism and colonialism, in part inflicted by the ancestors of those now surfing on the waves of growing prosperity in the pursuit of happiness. In the decades that follow, this conflict of interest will continue until the early 90s, when the idea of an open society based on the universal right of the individual to be free as long as they respect the same right for their neighbors looks like it has held the day as victor in the Cold War. 
2025. While the leisure society, youth culture, and the digital age is more present than ever, that philosophy once again faces multiple enemies from within and without. Don't join them. Go out, have some fun instead, flip a board, build something interesting with Lego, say something silly online using your modem connection, or play some video games. Because life is too short to be grim-faced, and as the philosopher Scooter put it, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. I hope you enjoy this little excursion into things that began in the 50s, and if you will, I might be back with more of these little oddities at some point in this series. I have a longer list. In the meantime, check out this video linked somewhere here around my head about inventions of World War II, and make sure that you join us to spread some fun, diversion, and insight by signing up for the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Excelsior! Thank you.